cool mask getting that set up. I'm Eitan, I'm another PhD candidate from the MDO lab. Um, and I wanna preface this by saying, really excited by what's going on with Aviary, what Jennifer and her team is doing. I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. Um, we have approached similar problems and I think hopefully I can answer some of the questions and open issues they have um, and see where there's room for collaboration and um, work together there. Cool. All right, so let me start by introducing what I mean by conceptual design. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so for me, what I have in mind is specifically using low fidelity models and coupled with some mission analysis to get some high level, um, I learned yesterday, called MOEs. Uh, and so you can get fuel burn, cost, uh, stuff like that. So the models look something like an aerodynamics model. You might use a parabolic drag puller. You could use some lookup table. Uh, you also have propulsion models. So this can also be a lookup table, a surrogate model. Uh, you also have weight models. These can be textbook methods, also lookup tables. Uh, and finally, you might have costs, which you could use as an objective there. And then one big thing that comes up, especially with electric aircraft that is often not considered is the thermal management side of things. You can see this is an all electric aircraft that duct under the nacelle is not an intake for a turboprop. There's no turboprop here. That's purely a ducted heat exchanger to cool the electric motor and the electronics in that nacelle. Um, so this is something that we can take advantage of in our tool called Open Concept. And so this is our conceptual design tool that's built on top of OpenMDAO. And we're, because conceptual design is so multidisciplinary, we can take advantage of the derivative capabilities in OpenMDAO to do uh, efficient multidisciplinary analysis and then use the total derivatives to do efficient optimization. So I'm gonna be saying, oh. <laughs> Saw a cursor there for a second, there we go. I'm gonna be saying we a lot during this presentation. I wanna give credit where credit's due. Um, this is Ben Brelge. For the sake of this presentation, he is the we. Um, <laughs> I, he started it in 2018. Uh, he was a PhD candidate also in the MDO lab. Um, and so a lot of the fundamental stuff, he was the one who implemented that, and which is a lot of what I'm gonna be presenting today. He graduated last year, he's now working for Joby and uh, I'm now the primary maintainer of this tool, so I've worked with him on some of the applications and I'll talk a little bit about those too. So let's start off with a, a simple problem that we can solve with this. So on the top left, you can see a, a King Air. In this, he studied retrofitting this King Air with a series hybrid propulsion architecture. And let's look at the, the optimization problem we're solving. So you'll see some familiar design variables here. We have MTAU wing area, we also have some uh, propulsion system parameters, so you have the generator power, the sizing of some other components, and then with the mission analysis, we can get fuel burn, and we use that as the objective. We also have some practical constraints here. We have a balanced field length constraint, a stall speed constraint, and with this, taking advantage of OpenMDAO, we can do tons of optimizations. So this, these plots are sweeps over design ranges and uh, battery-specific energies, and each one of those little boxes is an optimization. It, it only takes a couple minutes. So we can do hundreds of optimizations in a laptop in an hour or two. But that's a pretty simple problem. We can do way more than that. Uh, this is kind of a kitchen sink of all the thermal components we have. And it was actually a project for Roger Dyson here at NASA. Uh, so we start off with a parallel hybrid turbofan model. This is an offline surrogate model of Pi Cycle. And then we use our electric motor from Open Concept. We power that electric motor with a battery connected with a DC bus and a little fall protection, which is really just an efficiency penalty there. And then the battery produces heat. We need to cool it. So in this, we study using a, a refrigerator, so electric active cooling, to cool the battery, and there's a liquid coolant loop that goes through the battery. That refrigerator needs to eventually dump the heat somewhere, so we end up dumping it into the free stream with our ducted heat exchanger model, which is relatively detailed here. And what I think is really neat is we're getting down to the level of like sizing the, the pump we're sizing even the diameter of the tubes. We can account for how the coolant pipe diameter affects the sizing of the tubes, so for their weight, and also the pressure drop through the coolant loop. So those actually become design variables in our optimization loop. And roughly this problem ends up with something like 50 design variables and a few hundred constraints. Uh, we also have a similar loop for the electric motor. Uh, there's no active cooling on this side, but we still have the same pump and liquid coolant loop situation. And then because we can, why not? We also do it for the fall protection. 
And this is even hiding some of the complexity. This is just the propulsion architecture. All of this happens in emission analysis. Furthermore, the battery and electric motor are not assumed to be at steady state. The heat in doesn't necessarily equal the heat out. We can see how the thermal mass of the battery and motor affects the temperature swings throughout the mission and taken take advantage of the, the ability to accumulate heat there. Lastly, we do some kind of rudimentary trajectory optimization. We can change how the, the power of the chiller changes over the mission. We can also change the exit area of that duct for dumping the battery heat. And we can also change the amount of electricity going to the electric motor, so we're effectively changing how hybrid this motor is. And so we run this mission analysis. This is the altitude profile, and you can see it's all for the throttle on the right side. And after this, we can look at things like the motor temperature. And you can kind of identify here, top of climb tends to be a critical point here. Also, battery temperature, same deal. And we did, uh, you can look at how changing the area of the battery ducted to heat exchanger changes even the thrust on the heat exchanger. So you can see we're getting a little bit of thrust in cruise. You get a little bit of drag at the beginning of descent. And all of this happens only in a few seconds. So here I'm showing you what an analysis looks like. You run the Newton solver, and this is from scratch. We don't really set the initial values very carefully. Uh, it converges the Newton solver in six seconds, and after that, the physics are valid. You don't need optimization. So this is getting a physically valid mission that you can actually gain intuition and results from. And again, this is from the initial conditions. In an optimization, this only takes maybe a second, maybe less for each iteration of the MDA. So now I'm gonna talk about how we actually do this. I'll talk about our philosophy in developing the code, I'll talk about how we do the mission analysis, and then I'll discuss a little bit of what we learned through doing that process. So let's start with the code flexibility approach. So there's kind of this, uh, this problem that comes up a lot in software development. You can make things really flexible, which means you can use them for a wide range of problems, really customizable, but it often means that the user needs to do a little bit more work and a little more learning on figuring out how to actually set up models. On the other side, you can make it easy to use. You can make really well-defined interfaces. You plug in the aerodynamics, plug in the propulsion, and it assembles everything for you. This is easier to learn, but it tends not to be quite as customizable. And this tool was originally really designed for us, so yeah, we ended up not so easy to use, but it's, it's quite flexible. And let's look at what I mean by flexible. So the aircraft model really only has a few requirements. It ends up being an open MDAO group. The only requirements are you need to compute drag and thrust. Those are your outputs. You take in lift coefficient and throttle. And so these aren't actually this aerodynamic model, propulsion model. These aren't actually an open concept. These are kind of placeholders. The only other requirement is you need to output weight. And other than that, you can do whatever you want in this group. Uh, we end up assembling all sorts of thermal models, different propulsion systems. And one thing you might want to do is integrate fuel burn. So without this integration, you wouldn't really have any useful information out of this. So you can use this open concept integrator. You integrate the fuel flow from the propulsion model, and you end up with the fuel burn at the end of the day. Now with this aircraft model, you've got to do some mission analysis. So the mission analysis group usually starts off with this reading in of parameters from a, a dictionary file. And I'm showing this because I've heard it's pretty similar to the way um, Aviary does it. And you can see our naming scheme here. We also have a, a similar hierarchical naming scheme. And then you do the mission analysis. So this full mission analysis is one of the options that you can use in open concept. In practice, it's a lot like Dimos. You might see some uh, nomenclature that's similar here. There's this num nodes idea. And then it's built of phases that form a trajectory. And so you can really customize it to be whatever you want, but we have some predefined profiles. And you can see into the mission analysis, you pass this aircraft model. And that instantiates copies of the OpenMDO group in every one of the phases. So now I'm going to talk about how we actually do that mission analysis. So I think it's come up a few times so far, but what do we mean by mission analysis? So we're solving this aircraft model as it simulates flying this mission with some valid physics so we can get uh, useful results. So those results could be fuel burn. We can also look at component temperatures. In the future, we might be able to look at hydrogen boil off over the mission, all sorts of stuff that you might not even be able to imagine yet. So the way we do this is we assume, we break up these phases into nodes, and then at each one of those nodes, we assume steady state. So we're balancing the forces. This avoids working directly with the equations of motion, so we're not integrating net force or anything like that here. And it kind of seems like maybe you would be losing some important information here. So if you're accelerating, you don't have the extra thrust you need to accelerate. You're just assuming you match the forces at every one of those speeds. 
But in practice, this actually matches flight test data quite closely. So you can see here Ben and his thesis got data from Pipistrel from their flight test, and with Open Concept, he was able to match their data really, really well. So let's look at how the, the phases are generally assembled to form a mission. So in practice, every phase for the steady flight phases take in an airspeed and a vertical speed, and they use that to define the mission profile. But those alone don't tell you how long the climb phase needs to be in terms of time. Um, so each one of them is, each one of the phases is kind of designed in a custom way. So the climb phase takes in cruise altitude, and the duration is set such that at the end of the climb phase, you're at your cruise altitude. For the cruise phase, you're already at cruise altitude, so you use mission range to figure out how long the cruise needs to be, such that at the end of your mission, you've flown the range that the user has specified. The descent phase is, again, just airspeed and vertical speed, but you don't need anything else here. You just end when you reach back to the ground. But what you do need to do is pass the range at the end of the descent phase back to the cruise phase so it knows what the final range of the mission is. So you get a little bit of backward coupling there. So what happens inside of each one of these phases? So in this case, we'll just look at the climb phase. We have a Newton solver at the top level. It guesses the, the length of this the climb segment. As, you're, as I was saying, you need the duration for each segment, and that's the Newton solver's job. So it guesses the length, and then we use our integrator to integrate the airspeed and vertical speed. The integrator uses Simpson's rule, so that just works by taking groups of three components, fitting a quadratic to it, taking the area under that, and it does that sequentially over the mission. The integrator will then spit out the final altitude at the end, which we use in our, we just impose a residual that ends up being the, the one that Newton Silver uses to figure out the duration of the, the climb segment. The integrator also gives us altitude over the entire course of the mission, in this case just the cruise phase, and we use that with our atmospherics module to get out the flight conditions at each one of the nodes in the mission. Those flight conditions are passed to the aircraft model, which uses also the throttle and the CL from the Newton Silver. And remember, the aircraft model just has to take in throttle CL, spit out thrust, weight, and drag. So it does that, which is sent to the force residual. And all that does is compute net forces. So remember, we're balancing forces here so that uh, the net force is equal zero. So these end up going back to the Newton solver, and they're, they're driven to zero with the throttle and CL. In practice, we usually use a single Newton solver with sub solve subsystems on. And it, it tends to be robust enough for us um, we haven't had any problems with it, so we haven't gone to more advanced solver configurations there. The integrator isn't just used for this simple airspeed, vertical speed, integration to altitude. It also shows up in other places in the mission. So you saw this uh, integration of fuel flow to get fuel burn. You also can integrate uh, heat flows to get with thermal mass to get uh, temperatures and models. And then we also have this uh, custom Braille G Magic trademark. Don't worry, we don't charge extra for it comes for free with the code. Uh, and it, it, it automatically finds states within the model and figures out where they need to be integrated. And it also, like Dimos, has this link phases kind of idea. And it's all abstracted, so in practice, you can swap out integrators and you can implement whatever you want here. All right, now let's talk about the lessons we learned over the, the course of, the, of doing this work. So this code is definitely not designed for trajectory optimization. If you try to integrate the, or optimize the speeds at each of the nodes, for example in cruise, we often end up with oscillations here. Ben attributes this to the optimizer exploiting the weightings that Simpson's rule uses for the integration. We also think it might have to do with the fact that we're not actually accounting for accelerations at each one of the points. Um, so it's not taking into account, you need extra throttle to accelerate, and then you decelerate extra throttle, et cetera. So to get around this for our rudimentary trajectory optimization, we usually just linearly interpolate between phases. So we have control points at the beginning and end, and we just assume a linear interpolation for whatever variable we're controlling. Another big thing is using vectorization for efficiency. I think this has come up a few times so far. Um, so this is a simple motor component that we use. And you can see the option in the initialize function, num nodes, declares how many vector uh, points you have that are solved at once. And then the inputs and outputs, the throttle and the shaft power, all become vectors too. And then we use sparse partials to, to avoid additional cost because of that. Another thing that we've learned is using surrogate models for propulsion has been really effective. So we have offline surrogate models of pi cycle that uh, gets around problems that we might have with cost if it's not vectorized and also robustness that makes the problem easier to solve. 
We also have uh, offline propulsion models for our pr uh, propeller efficiency map. And I've actually developed some online surrogate models for open aerostruct with simple planforms that will automatically retrain the data and rerun open aerostruct when any variables change in the optimization process. Otherwise, it keeps the, the model the same and we can take advantage of the surrogate model efficiency. So now the question here is, what do we use for mission analysis? We have this open concept approach. It's fast, it's robust-ish, usually. Robust enough for what we do. Uh, and it's physically valid. You don't need an optimization to get useful results out of it. On the other hand, we have trajectory optimization approaches. From what I've heard, they tend not to be quite as robust, um, uh, but they, they're obviously better for trajectory optimization. That's why they're used for that. So they can represent the mission in a way that you can actually optimize states with the tra trajectory in a more um, effective way. So we've taken the first approach. We've used it to rapidly optimize aircraft architectures, and it uses the steady flight assumption at each one. So now the question is, uh, which do we use? And I'll kind of end with a, a suggestion here, M maybe interesting future research direction. Both have benefits, and maybe there's a way we can take advantage of both benefits. So on the open concept side, if you have a mission profile defined, maybe you want to use the open concept one. You can take advantage of that efficiency, having a, a physically valid MDA. Um, but if you want to do trajectory optimization, yeah, you probably want to use one of those other methods. So perhaps we could make it a, a switch to the user so that the user could change the underlying integration method on the fly. Or perhaps we use something like open concepts to provide an initial value for making the, the trajectory optimization more robust or uh, efficient. So with that, I'll close. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna ask the first question. Sorry, Jennifer. Your online training strategy, you're differentiating through the training of the surrogate model. Do you think you could apply that to the propulsion as well, or is it not viable? Um, yeah, I think so. The, the surrogate model I'm using for the open aerostruct side is not quite as advanced as the surrogate model we use for PyCycle. I think I was using, um, I can't remember the, the exact one for the open, open MDAO model, but the PyCycle ones use Krieging and that ends up getting a, a better fit of the data. Um, Krieging or gradient enhanced Krieging? Ben was the one who did that, I'll, I'll have to remember. I think, I mean, he, it was the one that he submitted to the OpenMDO code base, so is that okay. Krieging? I Just don't Krieging? I remember either, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I have lots of questions for you, but I'll start with one. <laughs> I'm wondering how this scales with an increased number of nodes. So if you wanted to handle, say, a numerically stiff problem and your cruise was really long but you had something like a thermal that was fluctuating a lot, something like that, would that cause a significant code slowdown? Would there be code efficiency issues or how would it handle that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't run into to challenges there yet. Uh, I mean, you saw it runs pretty efficiently. Um, so I think in practice, you could increase the number of nodes. In practice, we end up with maybe 20 or 30 per phase. Um, but if you needed more, you could, could be done. We don't have the capability to do like what uh, Justin, I think, mentioned yesterday, tandem phases. If you want to do different time scales for, for different components, we, we aren't able to do that yet. Small one, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, um, how do, do the integrator behaves when you do not have sufficient thrust? Does it fail or do you have um, bypass things to, to, to overcome this uh, difficulty? What was the word, when we don't have enough what? Thrust. Mm -hmm. Oh, thrust. From the engine. Um, yeah, that can be a problem. That's probably the most often one that comes up that uh, ends up ruining the, the Newton solve. Um, the advantage is if we start in a feasible one, which we can usually figure out some initial guess, the optimizer can make its way through the feasible region and back out when the, the analysis fails. But yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, another technique we use to do that is we sometimes let the thrust go beyond what the engine's actually capable of, say, like let it go to 110% or something like that. And then in the optimization, constrain it to 100%. So it gives the, the nonlinear solver a little more flexibility.
So this is a little bit of a two-part question. You may have just sort of answered part of it, but I'm wondering in general about incorporating higher fidelity models and then also specifically propulsion models. So first of all, how flexible is the code if I wanted to drop in a propulsion model and then do propulsion sizing? And second, if I wanted to drop in some other high fidelity type model, CFD, that sort of thing, is it flexible enough that I could do that? Um, so in practice, the aircraft model you saw, it's, it's just a group. It only has a few requirements in and out. It does l like to be vectorized. So uh, the aircraft model does require the throttle and CL will come in as a vector um, and be spit out as a vector. So if you can handle that efficiently, I think it would be capable of it. Um, you were saying specifically for propulsion was the first part. Uh, yeah, I think that would be capable. Again, surrogate models will depend on the number of inputs for scaling the, the training data you have. Um, and then the second part was just general high fidelity stuff. Yeah, so we haven't gone too much into that space. Uh, open Aerostruct is probably the highest fidelity we have in there, which I think most people would not call particularly high fidelity. Um, but in practice, I think it, it could be done. Surrogate models would probably be required because uh, Newton solve requires on the order of, you know, 10 iterations. And in each one of those, you need to evaluate at each one of the nodes. So that's 10 times maybe 30, 40, 50 points along the mission. And that kind of becomes intractable if you want to do optimization with that directly. Um, so in the past, surrogate modeling has, has been used online in particular. I think Realim has done a lot of work, work there. Just a suggestion for you then, you might want to consider switching some of those Newton uh, balances up to like a sand approach there. Hmm. Um, you might find it's faster. It's probably also less stable. But. Yep. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll say for our work, um, robustness and speed has been good enough. So we haven't put a lot of work into trying to make it faster, trying to make it more robust. Um, but I think in practice, we definitely could put an effort there and make it more effective. I, I was, if you're trying to put something more expensive in the yep. aircraft. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, just a note for the audience, the OpenMDO team learned something about OpenMDO today. You can use pipes in your variable names. <laughs> we didn't know that. <laughs> so, even we learned something here. <laughs> Any last questions? Jennifer has lots <laughs> of questions. This is my last one, I promise. I'm just wondering generally, what are the things that you see about this software that are the biggest deficits or areas that need improvement or specifically things that aviary could help out with? Hmm. Um, as you get bigger models, having it be this flexible can make it kind of challenging to keep track of things. So in that kitchen sink model I showed, uh, the aircraft group kind of gets messy. You end up with a ton of connections and a ton of groups floating around and subsystems. And figuring out how to organize that um, can be kind of tricky. And it sounds like you might have some strategies for, for fixing that. I think that's, from a user perspective, one of the biggest challenges. OK, thank you. I'll add weight. <laughs> how do you mean? Weight. The weight estimation. Yep. Are the methods that you have right now? For the at-home audience, the comment was the weight <laughs> estimation. Yeah, so I guess I'll cover what we do now, if that helps. Um, a lot of the studies have been retrofit so far because we have all this propulsion system analysis capability. So we haven't done as much from scratch, which means there's kind of a limited number of textbook weight estimation methods we have in there. Ah, okay, got it. Thank you. Yep. I would just like to note we had three talks now uh, that mentioned aircraft design tools in OpenMDO, Aviary, Fast OAD, and Open Concept. So I, for one, plan to find a way so that we can all collaborate. I think there's actually three unique approaches there that we maybe can all learn from each other. Absolutely. It doesn't have to all be one code to own them all either, so. All right, at this point, uh, thank you very much, Aitam. Great, thank you.